2020-044, which was entered by the chief judge of this jurisdiction on August 31st of 2020. And specifically, paragraph 1B states as follows for in-person hearings. Um, judicial determination that uh, the presiding judge um, can make a decision that the proceedings um, cannot proceed remotely if the court finds that to do so, um, to proceed remotely, would be inconsistent with the United States or the Florida Constitution. I make that uh, determination right now that due to the fact that this is a death penalty sentencing, that um, it would be inconsistent with both the United States and Florida Constitution that we proceed forward and that I sentence Mr. Ritchie remotely. Furthermore, um, I am empowered with the discretion, again, pursuant to S2020-044, subsection 1B, with the discretion to have speaking individuals remove their face coverings or to use face shields or see-through masks instead if A, an individual's facial expressions or features must be observed, or B, an individual's voice is inaudible or hampered and potentially could jeopardize the creation of an accurate record. So for that reason, um, if either the state or the defense is going to call any witnesses who wish to speak prior to the imposition of sentence, they will do so. That's a good reminder. Everyone turn off their phones, including me. Okay. Um, that they will do so from the witness stand. And if any witness feels that it would impair their ability to communicate with the court, to express their sentiment or feeling, then they may take off their mask. I would note that the witness stand is a sufficient distance from me, and I do not have any concerns about any witness testifying from the witness stand. And that applies both to any witnesses the state may call, to any witnesses the defense may call, and to the defendant himself. That rule applies to all. Furthermore, with regards to the lawyers, if you feel that the mask in any way inhibits you from conveying your argument on behalf of either the state of Florida or the defendant, you may come up to the podium, which is again at a sufficient distance from myself and anybody else, and remove your mask in order to address the court. Finally, um, the defendant is afforded the right, pursuant to the Constitution, to have confidential attorney-client communications with his counsel. I'd note for the record that Mr. Ritchie is currently situated more than six feet away from Mr. Brunvon and Mr. Hernandez, his attorneys. If, Mr. Ritchie, you feel it is necessary that you have confidential attorney-client communications at any time th during this proceeding, please alert me and then you have the right to have those confidential communications. Do you understand? Is that a yes? Yes. Okay, very good. All right, um, any, in, any further, um, on any questions on the process as far as that goes? Also, I'm making a specific finding that the court itself will not wear a mask during these proceedings out of respect to both the defendant and any members of defendant's family and the victim and the victim's family. And due to the sheer magnitude and consequence of these proceedings, I will not address any of you from behind a mask. All right, with that, are we ready to proceed with the entry of a plea? Your Honor, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. I left a uh, score sheet for you that has been corrected to include sex penetration victim points. Okay. So it has an additional 80 points, and we added that in by hand. We can email you a corrected uh, digital version later if you wish. That's fine. And Mr. Brunvon, have you had a chance to go over this score sheet with your client? I've gone over the score sheet with my client. Uh, I was just handed the one with the uh, additional 80 points. Um, do you need an opportunity? No. To no, we don't. Do that. Okay, Mr. Ritchie, do you need an opportunity to further review the score sheet that the state is submitting? No. Okay. And has Mr. Ritchie executed a plea form for the charges he's pleading to? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, as to 14. Uh, 2744 and 14724, they're both possession of controlled substance forms. 
uh, charges uh, with a five-year maximum the agreed upon disposition is 60 months concurrent with whatever other sentences the court imposes, and uh, it would be a guilty plea in his best interest. So I can approach with the plea forms? Yes. And then the remaining case, I believe, the state, uh, secular community case, is the state is going to file an all plus on that. Okay, state, do you have an announcement? Yes, Your Honor. On case number 2014, CF007347, which was a charge of unlawful sexual activity with a minor, the state announces an all plus on that case. Okay, very good. All right, Mr. Ritchie, um, I'm going to conduct a plea colloquy with you um, regarding that. You all can remain, you can have a seat. Um, conduct a plea colloquy with you regarding the charges that you're pleading guilty to. You can remain seated during the plea colloquy, but I do need to make sure that you speak up loud enough so that both I and the court reporter can hear you. Do you understand? Yes. Okay. All right. Very good. All right, Mr. Ritchie, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay, very good. State your, um, put your hand down and state your full name for the record. Brandon Ritchie. All right, Mr. Ritchie, um, what's the highest level of school that you completed? 10th grade. 10th grade, all right. And do you read and understand English? Yes. All right, sir, and um, did you review these two plea forms that I'm holding in my hand with your attorney? Yes. Did he go over them with you line by line? Yes. And did he explain everything that is contained in these plea forms? Yes. And on the last page of this plea form, is this in fact your signature on these plea forms? Yes. All right, very good. Mr. Ritchie, it's my understanding in case number 142744 that you're pleading guilty, and I assume this is in his best interest, Mr. Brinbon? Yes, sir. You're pleading guilty in your best interest to one count of possession of controlled substance. Do you understand that this is a third degree felony punishable by up to five years in the Florida State Prison? Yeah. You're also pleading guilty in your best interest in case number 14 CF 7234, again to a possession of controlled substance. This is also a third degree felony, also punishable by up to five years in prison. Do you understand that? All right, sir, and do you understand that by entering these um, pleas of guilty to these charges that you are giving up certain rights as explained in the plea form? Yes. All right, and specifically, do you understand that by, give, by entering this plea of guilty that you are giving up your right to require the state to prove your guilt at trial beyond into the exclusion of every reasonable doubt? You're giving up your right to cross-examine any state witnesses, to call any witnesses on your own behalf, or to present a defense. You were also giving up certain appellate rights. Do you understand that? Yeah. And um, were there any pretrial motions that were filed in either of these cases that would be dispositive? No, no. no. Is that correct, Mr. Harmon? That's correct. Okay. Your Honor, one thing I believe is the um, plea form may say controlled substance, but it should read um, marijuana. What, when is Which one is controlled substance and one is cannabis? Which one's cannabis? Seven, two, three, four. All right, well, you all did write controlled substance, so I'm gonna change that. I'm just gonna hand write it in. That's possession of cannabis. Over 20 grams. Over 20 grams. Okay, so Mr. Ritchie, let's address that one again real quick. So in 14 CF 7234, you're actually gonna be pleading guilty to one count of possession of cannabis uh, amount being over 20 grams. This is also a third degree felony punishable by up to five years in prison. Is that your understanding as well? Yes. All right, sir. And um, do, you, do you understand that if you plead guilty and are not a United States citizen and the court accepts your plea, that your plea may have additional consequences of changing your immigration status, including deportation or removal from the United States? Do you understand that you should consult with an attorney if you need additional information concerning potential immigration consequences of your plea? Yes. Do you understand that if you have not discussed the potential immigration consequences with your attorney, the court will, upon your request, allow a reasonable amount of time for you to consider the appropri appropriateness of your plea in light of this advisement? Do you understand that? Yes. Do you wish to have additional time to consult with an, another attorney regarding your immigration status? 
All right, and um, do you, you understand that the, um, the plea in this case calls for five years, which is 60 months Florida State Prison, to run concurrent with each other and concurrent with any other sentence that I gave you today? Yes. Are you currently under the influence of drugs or an alcoholic beverage or medication? All right, and um, do you have any mental illness today that would keep you from understanding this plea and its consequences? No. Do you understand where you are and what you are doing today? Yes. Has anyone, including your attorney, threatened you or coerced you in any way in order to get you to enter this plea? No. Are you entering this plea freely and voluntarily? Other than the terms of the, of the plea negotiation, as I just articulated, has anyone promised you anything upon which you have relied on in order to influence you to enter this plea? No. And have you discussed the charges with your attorney, including the maximum possible penalty and any possible defenses? Yes. Are you satisfied with the representation of your attorney? Yes. Do you understand by entering this plea, there is no guarantee what gain time, if any, the Department of Corrections or any county jail may award you? Do you understand by entering this plea, there is no guarantee what gain time, if any, the Department of Corrections or any county jail may award you? Yes. However, you will receive credit for all time served. Do you understand that? Yes. All right. And has anyone, including your attorney, made any promises concerning the jail credit or prison credit you are to receive, other than the fact that you are going to receive credit for every day you actually spent incarcerated on these cases? All right, is there any other type, um, are there any other witnesses you want your attorney to depose, investigate, call, or locate? Is there any other type of discovery or investigation at all you want your attorney to do prior to entering this, these pleas? Are there any motions you want your attorney to file and set for hearing prior to entering this plea? No. And has your attorney reviewed the discovery disclosed by the state with you? Yes. And did the discovery include a list or description of physical items of evidence? Yes. And has your attorney reviewed the nature of the state's evidence against you with you? Yes. And you did sign the DNA addendum, correct? Yes. And this is your signature on this form? Yes. All right, and is the plea tendered with the approval of counsel? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, very good. All right, State, please give me the factual basis on both cases. With regards to 2014 CF 2744, on February 24th of 2014, law enforcement conducted a lawful traffic stop on a black Acura. It was leaving a dark alleyway. The vehicle was also occupied by a black female passenger who was located in the front seat. The defendant's pants were unzipped. Once the defendant was removed from the vehicle, he consented to a search of his person where two crystal rocks were located inside of his right front pocket. The crystal rocks field tested positive for MDMA. A glass pipe with a milky residue was also located inside the vehicle. All of these events occurred within Hillsborough County, Florida, and the defendant can be identified. With regards to 2014 CF 7234, on May 17th of 2014, law enforcement at the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office was assisting Temple Terrace Police Department with an active investigation. The defendant, Randall Ritchie, exited a silver Lexus, which he was the sole occupant of. The affiant maintained constant visual observation of the vehicle while court authorized search warrant was obtained. On May 18, 2014, Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office and Temple Terrace Police Department executed that search warrant on the vehicle. Inside a black suitcase, there contains men's clothing. Among that clothing, law enforcement located 246 grams of marijuana. There was a small zipper compartment in that suitcase that yielded checks and receipts bearing the defendant's name. The marijuana tested positive for THC via field test kit. The defendant was identified in all of these events occurred in Hillsborough County, Florida. All right, I find the plea is voluntarily entered and that there is a, su a sufficient factual basis. Mr. Ritchie, do you agree that those are the facts the state would prove if, in fact, you were to go to trial? Yes. 
All right, um, in case number 14, 2744, we'll adjudicate you guilty, sentence you to 60 months Florida State Prison, giving you credit for all time served. This sentence is to run concurrent with any and all sentences that are imposed by the court today. In case number 14, CF 7234, I will adjudicate you guilty, sentence you to 60 months Florida State Prison, giving you credit for all time served. Again, this sentence is to run concurrent with any other sentences imposed by this court today. You have 30 days to appeal any illegal portion of the court's judgment and sentence. All right. All right, so we are ready now to begin um, with the sentencing in the capital murder trial. Um, first of all, on a personal note, I wish to thank Mr. Brunvon, Mr. Hernandez, Mr. Harmon, Ms. Johnson. Um, you are the epitome of professionalism. I only wish that every single lawyer that ever appeared in front of me was as diligent, as um, educated on the subject matter to which you all are representing your respective clients, and as courteous and professional, not only to each other, but to me. Um, I am so very grateful, and I just want you all to know how very grateful I am for your advocacy for your respective clients. So um, we will go ahead and proceed. So Mr. Harmon, are there any individuals that wish to speak? And again, um, any sentence I do, I always give anybody who wants to the chance to be heard. And that includes anyone from the victim's family, anyone from the defendant's family or friends, and the defendant himself, if he so, so wishes. However, it obviously the defendant does not have a difference whether you so with that, Your Honor, it's my understanding. Yes, I would. For the as well, but um, a lot of us not able to come because of the corona stuff or whatever coronavirus. But anyway, it is where I'm sorry. It's okay. Take your time. I miss my baby. I miss her calling me, just saying that I love you, Grandmama. She's always saying I love you, Grandma. And it's hard knowing what she has shown me, what had actually been done to her. But she do come to me all the time, showing me different things. But I'm not going to say as of right now. But it was wrong for what was done. And... I just miss my grandbaby. It hurts. It hurts every day. You're going to bed nice. You're waking up nice. Making up during the day. 
you can't sleep just knowing what has been done to her. Why would they want to just do this to her? It, it wasn't right. It wasn't right. It just wasn't right. Thank you. Just wasn't right. I miss my baby. I miss her. Dang it, can you give me some water? Please state your name. Shaquilia Givens. Ms. Givens, do you have a statement you wish to make to the court? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Like, I stand with my grandmother when she says it's hard. Like, everything in life happens for a reason. But this is one reason we can't understand why. Like, it's hard. He took a, a sister, my baby sister. He took an aunt. My children miss her every day. My older girls, they, they miss her. And I said, we miss her so much. Do you have a picture with you here today? Yes, ma'am. You want to show me the picture? Yes, ma'am. Okay. That's a baby picture of her. Precious, beautiful little girl. Thank you. And today, like, we don't have that no more. My, my one-year-old reminds me so much of her. I call her, like, she's a reincarnation of her. She literally is. My one-year-old is a reincarnation of her. And it's hard. It's hard for one this for one person to make a split life decision and you don't and we don't understand why. Because it didn't have to be that way. Like he didn't have to take her from us. He should have just left her alone. He should have just left her alone. Like you don't understand how hard how rough life he is without her. <laughs> The sleep is nice. We can't sleep for days because we don't, we don't, we miss her, we beat her bad. And the way he discarded her like she was nothing to us. Like she didn't mean absolutely nothing, but she meant the world. She meant the world to us. And he discarded her like she was nothing. Sorry. I say to you. Every dog has their day, and God is going to make, and your day has come. God got you now. Thank you. Thank you. Hey everybody, my name is Cha Cha and I just really want to know to you, Granville Richie, why? That's just really what I really want to know why. Like,
And Mr. Harmon, I had trouble hearing the witness's name. Cha Cha Adams. Thank you. That's fine. If they're in the same family, if they're in the same family, then they can they can be close together. That's fine. That's fine. They can come up if they would like to. And they can come up together. That's fine. Good morning. Good morning. Could you say your name, please? My name is Felicia Deverson. I am the mother of Felicia Williams. First of all, I just want to thank you for putting up with me and Ms. Johnson and Mr. Harmon for um, putting up with me. You don't need to apologize, Ms. Deverson. I want to thank a few people that made this happen. Uh, Temple Terrace Police Department, Captain Michael Lowell, the Investigation Division case, Detective Tom Carroll, he's retired now, but he's still in my heart. Lead investigator, Detective Dale Kelly, the primary point of contact, the entire Temple Terrace Police Department Criminal Investigation Unit. The assistant agencies, Al alcohol, tobacco, firearm, Clearwater Police Department, District 6 Medical Examiner, Federal Bureau of Investigation, Florida Department of Law Enforcement, Harrisburg County Sheriff's Office, Manatee County Sheriff's Office, Pinellas County Sheriff's Office, State Attorney's Office, Judicial 6 Circuit Court, State Attorney's Office, Office 13, led by state attorney, Mark Ober at the town, now led by attorney Andrew Warren at prosecution. ASA, Mr. Scott Harmon, prosecutor, during the trial, Tampa Police Department, United States Marshal Services, University of Florida, University of South Florida, and Mrs. Johnson. Circles of Mothers of Tampa, Florida, uh, Ladies of Essence, which is uh, my OES family, Order of Eastern Stars in Masonic. Um, also, I just want to say that I've waited 2,310 days for this day to come. I am here to stand as a wounded mother I'm here wearing all black because I'm here to bury this Jamaican today. Because by the time he's long gone, my eyes may be closed. Anyway, ensuring certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, we command to Almighty God, our brother, Grand Virgie, and we command his body to the ground at its resting place. I want to thank everyone, like I say, for putting up with me because he took away her innocence, her purity, her everything to get married, to bear children, just life itself. Some days, like I said, I don't know if I'm coming or going. I wake up, I think about her. I lay down, I think about her. I'm on so many different medications. And that's, that don't even help. 
The only thing I regret today is that I cannot ice for his fate. And that would be for him to be hung, for him to feel what my daughter felt over and over and over again. It took him three times to strangle her, to get her actually gone. And you know, I feel like death is the appropriate. My heart hasn't changed. And all I know, he needs to be like her. Thank you. This, this, um, yes, this, I have a picture I, you of do. her. Okay. Everyone knows this picture. Everyone knows this smile. And before you leave, Ms. Emerson, does the child's father wish to say anything? Okay. And I, Ms. Emerson, just real quickly before you all switch places and before you go, I want to speak to you. Um, I thought long and hard about what I was going to say to you. Yes, ma'am. Um, I first am in awe of your bravery and your tireless advocacy for your daughter. Thank you. And the fact that you were able to sit through this trial mm -hmm. with the horrific facts, you're a better, stronger woman than I am. I just want you to know that. Oh, say that. It's don't true. Know what, they don't know what I go through behind closed doors. And I, what has been asked of you to bear in this life is more than really should be asked of any human being. Yes, I think most parents have a moment where the child runs away from them, they can't find the child, a call or text message goes unanswered for a period of time, and I think most parents at some point have that sick feeling of dread. Has something happened to my child? Mercy? I, I know. Because in the way she went, she would call her mother. I know. For most parents, mercifully, the moment passes. But for a few unfortunate ones, it doesn't. Instead, it just becomes the first step in a never-ending nightmare that you can never awake from. And my heart breaks for you as a mother. Absolutely breaks for I you know, as a mother. I know. That's why I thank you. Um, but I know that you are a woman of deep faith. And I know that you know someday you and Felicia will have a joyous reunion and the pain and suffering of this life will be put behind you. Yes, so thank I wish you. you, I wish you all of the best. I thank you so much. I had this neighbor, all of us. It's absolutely beautiful. This blanket is anointed and it's consecrated. And when I get that feeling, I cover myself with this. Give me some type of comfort besides going to her face. And I just want to thank all of you for listening. And I thank all of you for, like I say, putting up with me. Because I felt like you put yourself in Mama Bear mode when you came to me. I felt like you took that judge off and put yourself in my shoes. And like I said, I want to thank you, Chief Albino, and uh, to Terry and everyone. God bless y'all and I love all y'all. state your name. Oh, Jerome Rodriguez Williams. I'm not like everybody else, bro. I ain't got no ill will against you. That same Bible that you play with, bro, you get back to yourself, you get on your knees and you pray. Because the journey you got ahead of you, gonna need God. I forgive you. I ain't got no anger towards you, bro. Abraham was willing to sacrifice his child. I sacrificed mine. I was you. I once was you. And in these same courtrooms, I was a monster. I'm pretty sure they don't told you about me. I'm the one you don't want to see, bro. You took something from me you can't give back. 
I don't want no revenge. I gave it to my God. The same God that you play with, I gave it to him. And he took that pressure from me. Because I couldn't deal with myself. A lot of people would have suffered if I would have dealt with it. But the fact that it took six years, man, for you to be a man and admit to what you've done wrong. All these people you hurt, man. Oh, phone calls through three o'clock in the morning, man. And I gotta get up my bed and go console her. Go get her from the grave site. Four day in the morning. And she there crying about my baby. That's the woman you gotta have for forgiveness. Let me tell you one thing about her, bro. It's hard for her to forgive. I've been dealing with for the last 17 years. And I'm still asking her for forgiveness. But I forgive you, bro. That's how strong my God is. I come in and smile at you today with no harm or ill wills towards you. You my brother. You made a mistake. But you got time. You got time to get right with God, bro. Like I said, I once was you. I was a monster. I was just like you. So if my God can change me to make me a better man, I can't do that. I celebrate the day. September 13, 2017. I've been out three years. They told me I'd never stay out three years and make it on these streets. The only have I been out three years? Started my own business. For to start another business. For to go to school to be a law clerk. So, if it took me to sacrifice and lose my child, because the last thing my baby said to me when I talked to her, she said, Daddy, I'm going to pray for you. And I sat and I wondered, what kind of father am I? If my child says she gonna pray for me, I should be praying for her. I should have been here to protect her, but I wasn't. That's what I deal with. And I'm pretty sure you know my baby called out for me. I wasn't there for my baby. But I'm gonna make sure I'm there for my others. Like I say, bro, don't play with God, bro. Ask him for forgiveness. You did wrong. Your mistakes just worse than others. When you get by to yourself, you get on your knees and you pray harder than you ever prayed in your life. And you ask for his forgiveness. Because I give you mine. I ain't got no ill will towards you, bro. I love you. You're a child of God. But don't play with him. Because if you play with him, he's going to destroy you. You take that Bible that them people give you, and you pray. And you ask him to make you a better man. Don't look at this as your life being over. I had 15 years mandatory. 12, 24, 2024, I'm still supposed to be in prison. He freed me, he released me. He brought me home. He can do the same for you. Like I said, I'm not like everybody else. I've been where you've been at. Still supposed to be where you be at. But he set me free. That's what he'll do for you. He may not release you physically. Spiritually, he will. But you pray to God, bro. You tell him that you made a mistake and you ask for his forgiveness. That's how I am. I asked him. He forgave me. And I got to go to the people that I hurt and I got to ask them for their forgiveness. That made me a better man. See, people all, all day long about they Christians. How can you be a Christian if you're not able to forgive a person that did wrong to you? You my brother. I don't care what nobody else say, I love you. You made a mistake. I forgive you, bro. I ain't got no ill wills towards you. But you go back and you ask God to make you a better man. Cause I asked him, and he made me a better man. So I asked that you do the same. I ain't perfect, I make mistakes. But he changed me from what I used to be. 
Like I said, I once was you. I was a monster. But he took that away from me. He helping me to be a better father. He helping me to be a better man. You got all these people, bro, that you got to ask for forgiveness from, especially her. And she's a hard woman for forgiveness. But before you leave this earth, bro, ask for her forgiveness. Ask her for that. The whole six years, ain't none of your attorneys, ain't none of your people reached out and ask nobody for forgiveness. I'm coming to you. I'm giving you my forgiveness, bro. I love you. But you need to ask that woman never for forgiveness. It may take some time. She's stubborn. But you gotta ask her. This right here, bro. I keep my baby right here. But do me that favor. That same vibe you got with you, bro. You sit down, you have a good conversation with God, man. And you talk to him. You ask him for his forgiveness. And I guarantee you'll feel the calm, calm you have never felt in your day in your life. That's what I feel, and I still feel it. I'm at peace, bro. You need peace in your soul. So you go and you ask him that tonight. You ask for his forgiveness, and I guarantee he'll give you a peace. Your earthly body is done away. But you got to build up when you go see them. You know what I'm saying? You got a mom. Your mom ain't raised you like that, bro. Just like my mom ain't raised me the way I was raised. So be a man. That's all I ask you before you leave today, man. Be a man and stand on your own two feet, man. I ask her for her forgiveness. That's all I've asked from you, bro. That's all I want from you, my you. We bless you. You ask her for her forgiveness. And we good. I made my peace. My peace with you, my brother. But you asked this woman right here for, for her forgiveness. We good. God bless you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right, and um, there was, um, and I've discussed it before, um, Ms. Demerson or someone on behalf of the uh, victim's family uh, when the trial was concluded on September 27, 2019 at 3 p.m. Um, handed a letter or a note um, to my bailiff. He immediately sealed it and, and brought it to me. I have not read it yet. And Ms. Demerson, I just want you to know, you, if this is from you or whoever it's from, you didn't do anything wrong. There's, there's nothing wrong. It's just that this could be considered an ex parte communication. So I felt that it was safer just to seal up the, seal up the letter, and I have not read it. And um, I will, however, after sentence is pronounced, I will then open it up and read it and make it a part of the record. So I, I just wanted you all to be aware of that. Okay. Um, so, Mr. Brunvon, um, is there anyone that would like to speak on behalf of the defendant, Mr. Ritchie? Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I have prepared a uh, written sentencing order 
and um, it will be filed with the clerk at the conclusion of this court's oral pronouncement of the defendant's sentence. Um, I am going to read from portions of it. I am not going to read the entire thing. It is very lengthy. So while I am reading from the order, Mr. Ritchie, you, re you may remain seated. However, at the time that I am going to actually pronounce your sentence, I will then ask you and your counsel to step forward to stand um, in order to be sentenced, okay? All right. On August 28, 2014, the Hillsborough County Grand Jury indicted the defendant Granville Ritchie for murder in the first degree, count one, sexual battery, victim less than 12 years of age, defendant over age of 18, count two, and aggravated child abuse, count three. On September 25, 2019, a jury found the defendant guilty of count one of murder in the first degree as charged. As to count one, the jury specifically found that the killing was both premeditated murder and felony murder based on the finding that the murder occurred during the course of a sexual battery on a victim less than 12 years of age, with the defendant being over the age of 18, or was committed during the course of aggravated child abuse. Defendant was also found guilty of sexual battery, victim less than 12 years of age, defendant over 18 years of age as charged, and aggravated child abuse as charged on counts two and three, respectively. On September 26 and 20. 2019, the court conducted the penalty phase of the trial where the state and defense presented testimony and evidence. The court held a Spencer hearing on January 7, 2020. At that hearing, neither party presented additional witnesses or evidence. As ordered by the court at the January 7, 2020 hearing, the state and defendant filed memoranda either in support of or in opposition to the imposition of the death penalty in this case. In opposing the sentence, the court has taken into account the verdict of the jury, the evidence presented at both the guilt and penalty phase of the trial, the Spencer hearing, and the sentencing memoranda submitted by the state and the defense. The court now finds as follows. Aggravating factors. Section 921.141 Florida statutes provides that the burden is on the state during the sentencing portion of a capital felony trial to prove beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of aggravating factors to, to, to support the imposition of the death penalty. In this case, the state argues the existence of the following aggravated, aggravating factors pursuant to section 921.141 subsection six. One, the victim was less than 12 years of age. Two, the first degree murder was committed while defendant was engaged in the commission of a sexual battery. And three, the first degree murder was especially heinous, atrocious, or cruel. As to the first aggravator, the victim of the capital felony was a person less than 12 years of age. The jury unanimously found that the state proved this aggravating factor beyond a reasonable doubt. The court agrees with the jury's finding that the state has proven this aggravator beyond a reasonable doubt and gives this aggravating factor great weight in determining the appropriate sentence to impose. The second aggravating factor, the capital felony was committed while the defendant was engaged in the commission of a sexual battery. In this case, the state presented testimony and evidence demonstrating that defendant sexually battered the child victim at the time of her murder, including the fact that her body was found unclothed and that she suffered blunt force trauma and lacerations on both the inside and outside of her genitalia at or around the time of her death. The jury unanimously found that the state proved this aggravating factor beyond a reasonable doubt. The court also finds that the state has established the existence of this aggravator beyond a reasonable doubt, that the defendant murdered the child victim during the commission of a sexual battery. The court therefore gives this aggravating factor great weight in determining the appropriate sentence to impose. Three, the capital felony was especially heinous, atrocious, or cruel. The Florida Supreme Court has provided that the heinous, atrocious, or cruel aggravator is applicable, quote, only in torturous murders, those that evince extreme and outrageous depravity as exemplified either by the desire to inflict a high degree of pain or utter indifference to or enjoyment of the suffering of another." Close quote. The heinous, atrocious, or cruel aggravator is reserved for murders that are, quote, conscienceless or pitiless 
and unnecessarily torturous to the victim, close quote. In this case, the jury unanimously found that the state proved the aggravating factor of heinous, atrocious, or cruel beyond a reasonable doubt. The court also finds that defendant murdered the victim in a heinous, atrocious, or cruel manner, and that the state established the existence of this aggravator beyond a reasonable doubt. Specifically, the court finds that, te that the testimony of Dr. Upshaw Downs and Dr. Randall Alexander establishes that the child victim suffered numerous injuries to her head, neck, body, and genitalia during the course of the sexual battery and homicide. Their testimony also established that the extensive injuries to the child victim's genitals were indicative of forced sexual penetration. These injuries, when perpetrated against a nine-year-old girl, would be particularly painful as her body was not physiologically prepared to engage in sexual intercourse. Additionally, the testimony from Dr. Upshaw Downs regarding the extens extensive injuries to the child victim's neck, signs of internal injury, and bleeding in the neck and head, hemorrhaging of the blood vessels of her eyes, and deep injuries to her tongue caused by forceful biting, all indicate that the victim was alive, conscious, and struggling for her life during the rape and homicide. Moreover, the defendant manually strangled the victim in order to kill her. The expert testimony established that this process took several minutes at a minimum to complete, allowing the victim to be fully aware of her impending death. One of the state's experts testified that to the child, she would have felt as if she were drowning. Taken together, the facts in this case established that the child victim suffered a horrendous, physically painful, and psychologically tortured, torturous death at the hands of the defendant. The court therefore gives this aggravating factor great weight in determining the appropriate sentence to impose. Sufficiency of the aggravating factors. A jury must unanimously find that, su that sufficient aggravating factors exist to warrant imposition of a sentence of death. In this case, the jury unanimously found that the above aggravating factors proved by the state were proved beyond a reasonable doubt and are sufficient to warrant the imposition of a death sentence. The court also finds that the above aggravators have been proven beyond a reasonable, reasonable doubt and are sufficient to warrant a sentence of death. Therefore, the court must now consider defendants proposed mitigating circumstances. Mitigating circumstances. The defendant alleges four statutory mitigating circumstances under section 921.141 subsection 7. Florida statutes and numerous non-statutory mitigating circumstances. Unlike the state's burden of proving the existence of aggravating circumstances beyond a reasonable doubt, a defendant need only establish the existence of mitigating circumstances by the greater weight of the evidence. The jury in this case found that one or more mitigating circumstances presented by defendant was established by the greater weight of the evidence. As such, the court will consider the proposed mitigating circumstances in light of the testimony and evidence presented at trial to determine whether the sentence of death is appropriate in this case. The defendant requested and the court instructed the jury on the following statutory mitigating circumstances. Number one, the defendant has no significant history of prior criminal activity activity. Defendant asserts that he has no significant history of criminal activity preceding the instant case. The court finds that this mitigating circumstances was established by the greater weight of the evidence and should be afforded moderate weight. Two, the capital felony, felony was committed while the defendant was under the influence of extreme mental or emotional disturbance. Defendant claims that he murdered the child victim while under extreme mental or emotional disturbance. After evaluation of the expert testimony presented by both the state and the defense, the court finds that the opinions of the experts conf conflict radically. The defendant bears the burden of establishing the existence of mitigating factors. 
It is also within the discretion of the court to reject a proposed statutory mitigator where defense experts testimony is rebutted by the evidence adduced at trial or the testimony of another expert. In this case, the court finds the testimony of the state's witnesses, Dr. Holder and Dr. Lazar Lazaro, more credible and persuasive than that of the defense expert witnesses, Dr. Einstein and Dr. Wu, as explained in greater detail in this sentencing order. Therefore, the court finds that the defendant has failed to meet his burden in establishing the existence of this mitigating factor. The court finds that defendant has failed to present any competent evidence to suggest that at the time of the instant capital offense, he was laboring under the influence of extreme mental or emotional disturbance. To the contrary, the court finds that the evidence introduced clearly indicates that defendant's behavior at the time leading up to the murder and afterward was calculated, rational, and goal-directed toward executing the offense and evading detection afterward. Based on the competent substantial evidence and testimony presented refuting any assertion that defendant was under the influence of an extreme mental or emotional disturbance at the time of the offense, the court finds defendant has failed to establish the existence of this factor. Three, the capacity of the defendant to appreciate the criminality of his conduct or to conform his conduct to the requirements of law was substantially impaired. A court may consider a medical expert's opinion as to whether the defendant could differentiate between right and wrong and whether he or she could understand the consequences of his or her actions. Pursuant to the facts established at the trial, the court finds the planning and actions executed by the defendant prior to, at the time of, and following the instant sexual battery and homicide are entirely inconsistent with an individual with an impaired capacity to appreciate the criminality of his conduct or who was incapable of conforming his conduct to the requirements of law. Instead, the court finds that defendant's activities at the time are indicative of an individual who is well aware of his actions, their criminal nature, and that he proactively operated to avoid detection and the legal ramifications he would suffer if he were to be caught. Therefore, based on the competent substantial evidence and testimony presented refuting any assertion that defendant's capacity to appreciate the criminality of his conduct or to conform his conduct to the requirements of the law was substantially impaired, the court finds that defendant has failed to establish the existence of this mitigating circumstance. The existence of any other factors in defendant's background that would mitigate against imposition of the death penalty. This is also referred to as the catch-all statutory mitigating circumstance. The defendant requested and the court instructed the jury on the following non-statutory mitigating circumstances. A, defendant suffered a significant head injury as a child but received no medication and has continued to have migraines afterward. The court finds that the only evidence presented regarding head injury suffered by defendant were the result of either defendant's own self-serving statements or from those of his family. No corroborating evidence was presented other than the testimony of Dr. Wu and Dr. Einstein, both of whom received this information from either defendant or his family. The court does not find this testimony based on defendant's own self-serving statements to be credible. Therefore, the court finds that this mitigating circumstance was not established by the greater weight of the evidence. Defendant suffered mental and physical abuse by his father and defendant's father was often absent because of four different families. The court finds that the video evidence presented by defendant during the penalty phase of the trial provided uncontroverted evidence that defendant's father was physically and mentally abusive to the defendant and other members of the defendant's family during defendant's youth. The court finds the uncontroverted evidence was also presented establishing that defendant's father was often absent from the home due to having relationships and children with multiple different partners. The court finds that this mitigating circumstance was established by the greater weight of the evidence and should be afforded moderate weight. Defendant was raised in a poverty stricken and violent neighborhood in Kingston, Jamaica. The court finds that the video evidence presented by defendant during the penalty phase of the trial provided evidence as to the conditions of defendant's childhood neighborhood. The individuals depicted in the video described the poverty associated with the area and recounted incidents of violence that occurred at the time of defendant's youth 
of which he would have been aware. The court acknowledges that the state called Miss Georgette Redley to rebut defendant's depiction of the area in which he grew up. However, because Ms. Redley lacked personal knowledge of the conditions defendant himself endured while growing up, the court finds that her testimony does not refute the evidence presented by defendant in regard to this mitigating circumstance. The court therefore finds that this mitigating circumstance has been established by the greater, greater weight of the evidence, but that it should be given little weight. Defendant was the oldest of 18 siblings and helped to raise them. The video evidence defendant presented during the penalty phase of the trial demonstrated that defendant has a close relationship with his family members and that he helped to financially support his family. The court finds that this mitigating circumstance was established by the greater, greater weight of the evidence but should be given little weight. Defendant was gainfully employed at various jobs such as a worker at Kingston Airport and then at Comtrans Communication making cell phone towers. The video evidence defendant presenting presented during the penalty phase of the trial demonstrated that defendant was gainfully employed while living in Jamaica. The court finds that this mitigating, mitigating circumstance was established by the greater weight of the evidence, but should be afforded little weight. Defendant was kind and generous to others and, and possesses other positive redeeming qualities. The video evidence defendant presented during the penalty phase of the trial de depicted individuals who spoke fondly of the defendant stating that defendant was known to be generous to people he knew and to the community at large. The court finds that this mitigating circumstance was established by the greater weight of the evidence, but should be given little weight. Defendant has a low risk of recidivism. After evaluation of the expert testimony presented on this issue, the court finds that the opinion of the experts regarding defendant's possibility of recidivism conflict. In this case, the court finds the testimony of Dr. Lazaro more persuasive and credible than that of either Dr. Einstein and Mr. Land. Therefore, the court finds that defendant has failed to meet his burden in establishing the existence of this mitigating circumstance. In an abundance of caution, the court has reviewed each remaining statutory mitigating circumstance. No evidence was presented to support any other statutory mitigating circumstance. In the instant case, the jury unanimously found that each of the aggravating factors presented by the state were proven beyond a reasonable doubt and that the aggravating factors outweighed the mitigating circumstances presented by defendant. The jury unanimously found that defendant should be sentenced to death. As such, the court has now conducted its own weighing process as required by law. Mr. Ritchie, I need you to stand and please approach the podium. Mr. Ritchie, the court has thoroughly reviewed and considered the record concerning defendant's trial, including both the guilty and penalty proceedings, as well as the memoranda submitted by both the state and the defense. The court has also evaluated and weighed the aggravating factors the jury has found to exist beyond a reasonable doubt and the mitigating circumstances established by the evidence. The court acknowledges that this weighing is not a quantitative comparison but instead requires a qualitative analysis of each aggravating factor and each mitigating circumstance. The court has assigned an appropriate weight to each and finds that the aggravating factors found to exist heavily outweigh the mitigating circumstances presented. The court finds that the jury's recommendation to impose a death sentence is consistent with its verdict and is based on the evidence presented regarding the aggravating and mitigating circumstances. The court agrees with the jury's unanimous recommendation based on its own assessment of the aggravating factors weighed against the mitigating circumstances. The court finds that the aggravating factors substantially outweigh the mitigating circumstances and sufficiently warrant a sentence of death in this case. Therefore, the court finds that the sentence of death is the appropriate penalty the court should impose for the murder of nine-year-old Felicia Williams as charged in count one of the indictment. Accordingly, as to count one for the first degree murder of Felicia Williams, the defendant Granville Ritchie is hereby sentenced to death. Defendant shall be delivered into the custody of the Florida Department of Corrections at the Florida State, Florida State Prison, where he shall be confined until a date certain selected by the governor of the state of Florida 
and on that date, defendant shall be executed in a method provided for by the laws of the state of Florida. As to count two for the sexual battery of a victim less than 12 years of age by a defendant over the age of 18 committed against nine-year-old Felicia Williams, defendant shall be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. As to count three for the aggravated child abuse of Felicia Williams, defendant shall be sentenced to 30 years imprisonment. Counts one, two, and three shall run consecutively to each other. However, the two cases you pled to earlier today will run concurrent with count one. Defendant is hereby notified that this sentence is subject to automatic review by the Supreme Court of Florida. Counsel will be appointed by separate order to represent defendant for that purpose. Further, pursuant to section 922.105 Florida statutes, defendant has 30 days from the issuance of a mandate from the Supreme Court of Florida affirming the sentence of death to elect death by electrocution by the procedures required by law. Mr. Ritchie, um, I do have one final thing to say to you. Um, there will be no corporal redemption for you. And what I mean by that is of your, your physical being, your person. You will remain incarcerated until the date of your death is scheduled to occur. However, um, I do not know what your spiritual leanings are, and it really does not matter to me either way. I am very grateful that I live in a country where people can believe or disbelieve anything they choose, and that applies to you equally. Um, however, if you do ever pray to a higher power, either now or at some point before the date of your death is scheduled to occur, and you truly seek forgiveness and redemption for the sins and the crimes you have committed, I hope that you are granted it. And I do still see the humanity in you. May God have mercy on your soul, Mr. Ritchie. We are now concluded, other than I am going to read um, the note that I received that was unsealed, or that was sealed, I'm now going to unseal it. And it is a card and it says, I thank God as I remember you. 2 Timothy 1, 3. And it's from the family of Felicia Williams and it's a photograph of Felicia, AKA Sugar Plum. And I, I wish to thank you all for this. God bless all of you. Thank you very much, we're now concluded. For the purposes of the charges that he pled to today. The understanding was that it was concurrent as to everything. They are. Okay. I'm sorry. They are concurrent. Um, as to each and as every to each, Yes, as to each and every count. Very good. And he has served more than the five years on those. Okay. Very good. Very good. Yes. Can I have a Do you say count one, two, three, two, one consecutive? Yeah. And could they concurrent with his other case? Correct. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Brunvon and Mr. Harmon, I do have uh, conformed copies of the um, sentencing order. The original is going to get filed right now with the clerk. Your Honor, there was one other thing. Ms. Johnson had prepared a sexual predator order uh, that I locked up here. Yes. The capital sexual battery. Which I will sign. And um, if you all, Mr. Harmon, Mr. Brunvon, if you want to come grab a copy of the sentencing order. And I will post a copy on my website, website as well.